Hey everybody, thanks for watching. A lot of people ask me about my music, how do I do music, how do I record, and I thought I'd spend a little time in this episode talking about how I do music. The first thing I want to say is not a lot of people know that I cannot read or write music at all. I don't know a E flat 7 from a D sus major minor blah blah blah. I could put my finger on a white key and skip a key and go to the next key and go to the next key and that's, that I know is called a triad. And then I could move my middle finger or my third finger or a combination of the two sharp and flat to make it sound better. So um, I don't know music. Everything is done completely by ear. I've done over 120 records. Um, I can actually score for a symphony orchestra. I had 200 piece choir, but I can't read a friggin' chart. Um, everything was learned. When I was a kid, my parents sent me to um, have piano lessons. And, and this na in my neighborhood in Brooklyn, this old goat <laughs> was uh, teaching piano lessons. And I went to her, and she had a ruler. And she would tap it on the uh, you know on the piano, and then after the third lesson, I got something wrong, and she hit me right across the knuckles, and I went. <clears throat> I got a nice big booger and a water spit, and I <clears throat> I spit it right in her glasses, and she stood there in shock as the spit dropped off of her glasses, and I said, "Don't you ever touch me again." So the music lessons didn't work out. Um, I started doing very early stuff in the 70s when I was 15, 16 years old, smoking pot, and I got a Radio Shack, or Tandy if you're in Europe, um, uh, synthesizer kit, and I literally soldered my first synthesizer together. And I'd sit there, smoke a joint, and twist knobs, and I had a black light poster, you know, and one of those lamps that have, when the heat goes up, it sends the uh, the pictures around the world and uh, around the room and incense burning and uh, I used to get high and make crazy space sounds and listen to synthesizer bands like uh, Tonto's Expending Headband which were we would now call ambient or experimental music back then it was stoner music um, and I went from my first built synthesizer to buying a Roland SH oh SH101 no it wasn't the 101 uh, Oh, I can't remember. It was a very early synthesizer that had little tabs on the front of it that let you uh, make sounds like a flute and all that kind of stuff. And uh, later on, I bought a large um, ARP 2600 synthesizer. You could Google it. It's got all kinds of knobs and faders with patch cords. And I went to New School for Social Research in New York City, and I learned synthesis. And that's basically taking a course in, in physics. We had to learn about sine waves and square waves and what kind of a wave makes a, a string, what kind of a wave makes a reed sound. So we learned synthesis from a physics ground up thing. Instead of today, a lot of kids are really lucky. They press a button, it sounds like a bass, but then they could turn a few knobs and it modifies it. We had to build all that stuff from scratch. This is before computers. This is before sequencers, anything digital, and uh, 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 any of that kind of stuff. We learned with control voltages, and if you ever see old synthesizers with patch cords, we were like mad scientists in the lab. And uh, my first record was done before computers, sequencers, and uh, samplers and all that kind of stuff. So um, I had, by the time I did my record, I was one of the first persons to buy a programmable drum machine. All the drum machines were that little beep, beep, boop, beep, boop, beep, beep, kind of like in the beginning of Blondie's Heart of Glass, if you know that song. Those are push buttons and it said bossa nova, rock, swing, jazz, and they were programmed little beep, pop, beep, pop kind of things. Roland came out with something called the TR-808. In fact, there's two movies. I'm in one of them uh, called 808. Um, th th uh, there's a couple of another one or two movies out about that drum machine. That was the start of a lot of electronic 
uh, electro, electronic, techno, whatever you call it, dance music, because instead of using one of those little pre-programmed beep bop beep bop, you were actually able on a grid to program where the kick drum falls, where the snare drum falls. They had 16 buttons and you'd press the buttons and uh, it would step through each one of those steps, making a kick, a snare, a hi-hat, and you were able to do your own beats. In a lot of the stuff that I did, Hip Hop Bebop, Boogie Down Bronx, uh, Planet Rock, all those things were done based out of this 808 dr drum machine. The back of the drum machine had a little pulse coming out of it and uh, a little, little electronic signal and I could program a cowbell or a rim shot if I wanted my bass line to go bum bum ba bum ba bum bum ba bum I would program clock 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 and when I hit play on the drum machine it would send that little pulse out six simple synthesizers if you know the song all the little pulses it would send that pulse out to a synthesizer and the drums and the baseline were synchronized together. Now, how do you get all the other tracks to line up in sync like clockwork? Well, now we have computers that do that and they synchronize 128, 256 separate individual tracks if you want. Back then, you could only get the drum machine and maybe a bass line or a sequencer line to play together. Uh, um, and it was quite difficult. There was only one machine that could do it, which I actually have, which was called a Roland MC8 microcomposer. And you would sit there with a, with, with a calculator and you'd have to type stuff in hexadecimal. You'd have to have so many notes per bar, beats and measures. And if you were off a note or a clock step and all these technical things, you would get a quarter of the way into the song and all of a sudden your drums and your bass line and sequence align with like two flashing lights would eventually become out of sync and it became nightmares to edit and all that. Um, but I came up with an idea of, um, I would print the bass line and the drums on a 24, well, I had an eight track tape at home. So we can go from that because a lot of my records were done that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and then when I uh, do the bass line and the drums together, they were synchronized and I'd roll the tape back and I'd program a new se sequence of sound and I would hit, I would start the tape rolling and on the downbeat of one, I would hit the drum machine and like two blinking lights, it would go for eight, 10, 12, 15 bars and then it would start to fall out of sync. I'd have to roll the tape back to maybe bar nine, hit play and the bar 10, hit it again and I would punch in or we'd start recording from bar 10 to bar 18 and then it would start falling out of sync again we'd have to roll it back to 18 we say we i mean me and uh, pick it up for bar 18 and go 19 to 35 and many songs had two three hundred bars over eight different tracks so it was like needlepoint it was like doing microscopic surgery and i know a lot of kids are like oh man you came from analog pre-computer days you were so lucky well, let me tell you, it was a nightmare. Synthesizers weren't digital then. A lot of them had, still had analog circuit. So if you set up a bass line and you didn't record it right away, you left it alone and you shut down your studio and you came back the next day and not, 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 no knobs were touched, it would sound completely different because the circuits were analog and they would expand from heat. The, the heat of the instrument would actually physically expand the boards and change the sound. The filters didn't sound the same and the oscillators didn't sound the same. So it was, when you had a sound, it was a rush to do it. And then later came out digital synthesizers. If you liked the sound, you would hit a save button like you do on your computer, save or save as, and then you had libraries suddenly of sound. I was one of the first people to have a sampler and a sampler takes well, back then it was only a half a second recording at what would now be telephone frequency range. And you could take that recording and play it up and down the keyboard. So a lot of stuff we did was we would take vocals. If you know the song Freeze, A-E-I-O-U, or they would take a voice, voice, ba 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 voice, ba 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 You could take a voice, you could take a, a trumpet, you could take a sound and making a sample of it, stretch it out over a keyboard and play it musically. Uh, I think that was monophonic. It may have, the emulator one, I was the first person in New York to have it, so I was rented. I, I got to do a lot of sessions because I had a, uh, a Prophet 5 s uh, synthesizer and an emulator one. Um, Herbie Hancock borrowed it 
rented it for, uh, he did a, a, in fact, there's probably a video on YouTube. He did uh, a demonstration on like Good Morning America, or one of those shows, and showed off sampling. And when I got it back, it was busted, and I couldn't afford to have it fixed. And, uh, you know, the rental company said it's Herbie Hancock's fault. Herbie Hancock's people said it was the rental company's fault. So I somehow or another got the money up and got it fixed. Uh, it wasn't anybody's fault. It, it just, whatever. Um, my first album was done with a Roland 808 drum machine, a Prophet 1, which is a monophonic synthesizer for the bass line, a Prophet 5, which was a keyboard where you could play up to five notes. Everything up until then has mostly been monophonic. So this was one of the first early synthesizers where you could actually play chords. Uh, they didn't have the circuitry and the computers to do it then. And uh, that's pretty much a chunk. I had a um, Oberheim sequencer module. I know a lot of people, this is going through their heads, but the geeks out there know what I'm talking about. And that was basically my studio setup. I recorded in my loft on 38th Street, people like Klaus know me and stuff like that. And I did my first album when I lived on 14th and 9th, and later on uh, at my parents' house in Brooklyn, the apartment upstairs from my dad's. It's a two-family house. They moved out, I took over the house at the apartment and one, the big bedroom was set up as a giant synthesizer studio. Today, synthesizers are plugins. They're things that you pull down a menu and a virtual copy of these old keyboards come up as a little window and they sound identical. They, they, they physically model, the best way I could explain it, these keyboards today, but back in those days, I would have keyboards on top of keyboards. It was like a giant room. If you look at uh, somebody like, um, Jean-Michel Jure, Katara, Vangelis, they have all these old stacks of keyboard that kind of situation. Uh, uh, and it was all put into an eight channel mixer, Tascam, and it was recorded on an eight track tape, which is different than the cartridges that you played in your car. There were only eight tracks, so the voice was on one, the bass was on another, uh, maybe a background vocal on the next one, uh, a keyboard part, a guitar part. You had two tracks left for uh, um, drums, uh, you know, percussion, and that was it. And the great thing about that and why these records, old stuff sounds so great, we, I was forced to learn arrangements because we didn't have, like today, 200 tracks if I wanted to. Back then, I was forced without bouncing stuff down. You could take five tracks and bounce it down to one mono track and then open up four more tracks. I didn't believe in that, so we were forced to do arrangements where you had to you know, bring things in and out to keep the listener's interest going. Um, that went on for many, many years. I had a 24-track machine in my house. I got my first uh, Apple computer. It was a Mac 512 Plus with opcode software. And I was able now to have MIDI, Musical Instrument Digital Interface, this, this plug that you would plug in and then plug into the other synthesizer and all the synthesizers around your room and plug that into the computer. And you could speak to all the different uh, synthesizers simultaneously, which was great, but the computers weren't really strong back then. So a lot of the songs would drift and sputter. But little by little, we started to get the recording process. Um, I bought the first digital editing system. It was uh, a digi design. Oh, what was it called? Sound designer. Uh, sound designer. It, it was a computer, a, a Mac 2C computer and a, and a box and it was $12,000. And uh, where did I get? Oh, I told my mother, I said, I want this and I need help, you know, with the money. And she said, I'm not giving you that kind of money. And I, I remember very definitely, I said, well, if you don't give me the money, I'm gonna sell drugs and become a male prostitute until I raise enough money. And she, she guessed, she said, let me speak to your father. <laughs> uh, they probably financed it on a credit card or something like that. But about a week later, I got my editing system. And again, being the first person in New York City, and New York City, a major place where albums were recorded and TV commercials, I got a lot of work doing digital editing. You could do things without a razor blade, you could turn it around in seconds, and it was uh, you know, a digital copy. Um, now my setup is a Mac Pro 
computer. It looks like the trash can. And it's basically a supercomputer. I know you can't sell it to countries like North Korea because it's so powerful. And I can get probably 256 tracks. It has 12 cores, which means there's 12 computers sitting in this one computer. That's how powerful it is. And I have these giant sample libraries. Uh, one of the people I worked with for a short time, and I know Trolls sometimes listens, is 8DO, 8DIO. If you go and you check out their product, it's pretty amazing. They have these incredible libraries of choirs and guitars and, 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 and DJ stuff. Um, in fact, the libraries from some companies, and they're very expensive, they're thousands of dollars for these custom libraries, are so advanced that I could put in the word man parish where you could type it and a 200 person cry out saying man parish or whatever chords I want to do. So that's the state of music right now. I still can't read or write music, but I can orchestrate and I can produce. It's all done by ear. I know a lot of people have been asking me, how do I do this? Um, I've always felt a little inferior to other real musicians because I couldn't talk turkey with them. And I developed insecurity. So I didn't, couldn't work with other musicians. Hey, can you change that from a G minor to a inverted blah, blah, blah. I, I couldn't do any of that. So I learned how to do my own music and how to make my own music by, by listening. And I guess that's how I developed a sound. Now, I don't hear the sound, but a lot of people say, oh, you've got a very unique sound. Well, I didn't know. And another thing is because a lot of dance records were one hit wonders, I was one of the first people to put out an album of electronic dance music other than Kraftwerk. And uh, I'm trying to think of anybody else at that time. It was before Suicide, maybe around the same time, a local group Suicide, but I did kind of like radio uh, dance stuff. So a lot of people looked at me now as an artist and a real musician. In those days, you weren't a real musician until you put out an album. So I was kind of the first to do that. So, you know, the New York Times says I'm the godfather of dance music, hip hop, techno. I mean, I was just the first person that did it and put it out there. There's a whole story about the record label and how I didn't get paid, but a lot of people have been asking me, how do I write music and what equipment did I use? So once again, my first album was an 808 drum machine, a Prophet One uh, keyboard for bass line. I had a, uh, a Prophet Five for um, keyboards and stuff. I think I had a Korg Poly Six or something like that. I can't remember and an Oberheim module that I barely used. But that's basically what I used back in those days. And this is from the computer age on. Before the computer age, I had Moog modules. I had a Buchla synthesizer. I had an ARP 2600. These are those analog beasts that look like a, like a switchboard with all those cables. So I hope that answered a bunch of questions. Music, but I love doing it. I do dance music. I do ambient music. I do film scores. Uh, I did a movie trailer. Uh, a lot of different stuff. I did something with um, Roberta Flack that didn't get to come out. It was for a movie. Uh, so I'm still quite busy and doing a lot of work. I just released an album. If you go to iTunes, I have 120 tracks. I'm in 30 digital outlets around the world. Uh, iTunes, uh, Amazon, uh, you know, wherever you get your digital music, type in Man Parish and you'll see some stuff. I just did an album called Star. Uh, I was one of the last people to work with Steve Strange from Visage before he died. Uh, I worked with Steve Bronsky, Bronsky Beat. I can go down a list of names, but I don't want to bore you with that. Well, I hope that answered some questions because people have been asking me and asking me and asking me. And thank you for listening. This is a little geek stuff, but, you know, I had to get it done. Uh, there'll be a lot more stories. I have uh, uh, more celebrity stories, some sad stuff, some crazy stuff. But... Um, Thank you for following. If you could please subscribe if you haven't and please share. Uh, and if you don't know, I have a, at this recording, I have about 15 other stories. So if you go back and take a look, there are some really goodies in there, some, some dishy ones and uh, some scandalous ones. There's Madonna, Michael Jackson, uh, 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 a bunch of other household names that you'll know. Thank you so much again for listening and, uh, you know, keep listening. Subscribe. Thanks.